at your Frayer model template. Everyone should be looking at their Frayer model template on their desk. For definition, I will allow you to either use dictionaries. You can come up with your own definition from what you learned about it. You can use your notes to come up with a definition defining what that what is an amphibian. So basically, can someone raise their hand? Tell me what is an amphibian without giving all of its characteristics. Just give me a basic definition of what it is. Very good. All right, so he defined that very well, all right, using great um, vocab terms. All right, so slimy skin, he said, they, live, they start, it's kind of like a fish. They start, well, they're not a fish, but they start their life in water, and then they metamorph into an animal that can live on land by growing what? Lungs. Lungs, very good. All right, so that would be a definition. It's a very brief explanation of what that animal group is. Then you would move to facts and characteristics. Facts and characteristics is something, anything, about, a fact about that animal type. So you can say they do what? They lay eggs, they have smooth skin, they, at first they have gills and they get lungs. Any characteristic or fact about that animal group. You would move then to examples. Give me an example, someone raise your hand, of an amphibian. Salamander. Salamander, thank you. Salamander is a great example of an amphibian, an animal that lives half of its life or part of its life in water, then grows into an adult and lives on land because it grows lungs. What would be a non-example? What does the, um, st the stem word non mean? Not. not. So something that is not an example of an amphibian. Trinus? A cat. Is a cat an amphibian? What type of animal is a cat? Mammal. Mammal. Give me another non-example, Lauren. Turtle. Good. A turtle is not an amphibian. A lot of people think it is because it's kind of similar to a frog. A turtle is a reptile. Very good. Give me one more non example. Mouse. mouse. All right. What is a mouse? Mammal. Mammal. All right. So, everyone understand what we're doing? If you understand, put one finger up. All right, everyone understands. Awesome. So the now, objective for that was from a previous lesson before that, and they had to um, compare and contrast vertebrates and invertebrates. And in not just the two categories, they had to break it down into the five different types of vertebrates and the five different types of vertebrates, invertebrates, I'm sorry. And a lot of times they kept mixing up different characteristics of different invertebrates. The vertebrates, they were fine. The invertebrates, I know it's, it's a mix of words, but invertebrates, invertebrates were a little bit more difficult for them. So I did the Frayer model so that they could use, you know, they could think of characteristics of each group that they were given, and then they could find examples of those, and then they could also think of non-examples. So if they were thinking of, say the group they were given was a segmented worm, they could give characteristics of a segmented worm. Some examples would be earthworm and leeches, but a non-example would be um, an insect, some type of bug. That would be a non-example. And so I think that helped them kind of break apart the two different groups and try to, you know, get the characteristics to go to the right group. Very good. Who's doing non examples? Okay, so who's doing five facts and characters? Who's drawing? All right, then you need to go in and draw. You do the drawing and they'll do the information. Because you're going to be filling in the information as well for this, okay? Mammals are in the thermic, very good. I did. It was challenging. I think the most challenging part of it is the non-examples. That was challenging for some of the students to think of, okay, what is this not? It's cool to say what it is, and that's easy, but to think of what is not, I think that was a struggle for some of the lower level students. I would, for their chart paper, instead of them having to um, 
like if I give them a group for a freer model and in the middle you have the um, group I think I would go ahead and write that out because that would take a good two minutes off <laughs> and already have their group and have their freer model built on their chart paper because uh -huh. everyone wanted to be perfect and draw the beautiful little lines yeah but that took five minutes for them to draw the little perfect line so mm -hmm. I think I would go ahead and do that for them then just go ahead and give them the chart paper they were assigned to yeah I think that would take a lot of the time off so just timing is nice do a quick um, gallery walk and that means we're going to walk around and look at everyone's creation. We're going to just, with your group, you're going to travel to one table, look at it, read it, get the information, and I may ask you a couple of questions about the posters I see that you visited. Alright? So everyone stand up quietly. Stand up. Everybody? And I want you to move clockwise. What does it mean clockwise? This way. This way. All right? Clockwise. This way. So everyone's going to move to the next table. All right? These are your instructions. You're going to look at it. And when you hear my hands clap, you're going to move to the next table that is beside that clockwise. So if you go to this table, you're then going to move to table one. And when I clap my hands again, you're going to move to Table two. Understand? Can you do me right. a favor and give me a non-example of the, um, give me one of the non-examples that the group that did mammal chose. Very good. I'm going to give you a ticket. Don't forget at the end of the period. Good job. All right. Jordan. Give me an example of one of the, I'm sorry, give me the example the invertebrate group over here chose. Give me one of their examples. I think jellyfish was one. Good job. Remind me to give you a ticket at the end of the period. All right. Thank y'all for paying attention. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Caroline. Give me a fact of the amphibian group that they chose. <laughs> you want to do an? Ex you think an, you know an example? What's an example? Good job. Yeah. Give you a ticket at the end of the activity. We're trying to summarize what um, body structures the animal can use to either defend itself, to obtain resources, and to move. So you're going to do a writing, a um, little writing prompt, I guess, if you want to say a paragraph. And you're going to explain how you're going to choose one animal to write a paragraph explaining how that animal uses body structures to either move, defend itself, or obtain resources. All right, so I'm just going to read one that one of my classes did. Oop, making a mess. All right, so the I.I., now this is, a, he didn't write as many sentences as he should have, but the I.I. uses his hearing by tapping on the wood to hear where the insects are. Remember the I.I. video I showed you all? All right, he, when he, he uses his finger to tap. When they find where the insects are, they grab, they grab the insect with their little fingers. They also use the little finger to put the worm in his mouth and chew. All right? That is all you're doing. What body structure did the I, I use? Raise your hand. Josh. His hand. Is his hand a normal hand of like a lemur? No. He does not have a normal hand like a lemur. His, his body structure is structured in a certain way that his finger is very skinny. So he can, y'all remember how it looked, looked funny when he was tapping. Mm -mm. It's flexible like that. All right, because remember how it looked. It looked weird. He was tapping on the wood, trying to hear where a, where a hollow place was. And where a hollow place was, that he knew the worm wasn't there. So he kept tapping. He kept tapping. He kept tapping. Then he heard it. What did he do? What did he actually use to get through the wood? His teeth. So he looked like this when he was toning in the wood. So he used his sharp teeth to break the wood. What happened when he saw the worm? That same little finger, he stuck it in that little hole, and what did he do? 
grab the little worm out. What did he use to eat the worm? Did he just swallow it whole? Did his body absorb the worm? He had to chew it. With what? Teeth. All right. So everyone understand? All right. I would have actually, I think my mistake is not actually telling them the connection. I think I just kind of guess wanted them to figure it out or they should already know the connection. Maybe if I would have told them in the beginning. So what we learned yesterday, this is why this is important because what we're learning today about their body structures, every animal has a different one and they have to use those to actually survive. So they thought they were just learning, okay, it makes them move, okay? <laughs> it makes them get resources, okay? But why is that important? Because if not, they, they, they're not gonna survive. So I think I, I should have made that connection in the beginning. So I'm, I'm trying to think of a strategy that I could have done to help them make that connection, but I know that it, that was a, I didn't do that. I, well, I will say, it seemed, to me, it seemed like a very easy concept to understand. You know, these are animal structures. They use that to defend, move, or, you know, get their food. For them, the word obtaining resources, they don't really even understand. As many times that we've gone over that, how all organisms have to obtain resources that term they just they make it so difficult I'm like all it means is that they're either getting food or there's some way somehow getting oxygen and energy they can't get that so that did kind of shock me that even though we went over this a million times they know that the animal has body structures but what does that have to do with them getting the food and what you know so I had to keep breaking it down all right you have a monkey yeah there's food over there but how does the monkey get there he has to use his body structure, his legs, to, or his arm to swing on the tree to get there. So um, that did, I guess, shock me that they were just like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, guys, to me it was easy, but I have to always put myself in a sixth grader's mind, which is hard for me to do sometimes, because <laughs> I want to think abstract, and they're still like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, Miss Howard, you're like an adult, <laughs> and think like the students that you teach. Oh. Because, of course, if I tell you something, you're going to go ahead and make the connection. That's just... We're, um, our minds are mature enough to do that. For 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds, they they just think they're learning something new every day. Like, okay, cool. But well, they don't see, okay, that has to something to do with what we learned yesterday and the day before that. So it all comes together in one big puzzle. But I don't really connect the puzzle too often, which I should. I just give them a new piece of a puzzle every day. But it comes, it's supposed to be one big puzzle. And I think that's why a lot of things are confusing to them why it's hard for them to understand some of the concepts we go over.